Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Can everybody hear at the back? Just, just give me a wave if you can't hear me. Okay, it's a slightly strangely shaped room designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott, famous Victorian architect for his brother, who is the first incumbent of St Paul's Church next to us. So you had to imagine a piano in here and the and a vicar's wife and tea and crumpets and that kind of thing. Uh, but here it is, we've converted the building. Uh, Cambridge Muslim College has been around for about 12 years now. The idea being to add to the existing archipelago of seminaries and theological faculties and institutes in Cambridge, some of which are connected to the university, others of which are independent, uh, something that's specifically Islamic. So we have two Anglican seminaries in Cambridge, we have a Catholic ladies uh, establishment, we have uh, Westminster College, which is for training young people for the United Reformed Church, there is Wesley House, which Methodists, you get the idea. So we thought time for Islam to show its face on this kind of skyline of different religious institutions. So what we do is, at the moment, our main course is a BA in Islamic Studies, which is accredited by the Open University which is a three-year course that requires the knowledge of Arabic before you come so that they can move really fast. And we focus particularly on the theological, philosophical, theoretical aspects of religion rather than filling their heads with lots of uh, fiqh rulings, although we cover the traditional topics as well. We also have a, uh, uh, a course in contextual Islamic studies and leadership, which is quite different, which is for imams who have been to the Darul Ulums, these are the seminary type institutions, mostly in the north of England, um, uh, but who, as a result of their training in a rather insular world, are perhaps not sufficiently aware of the reality of modern Britain and how to engage successfully with uh, the various peoples of Britain, how to preach relevant khutbahs, how to deal with ethnic and sectarian diversity, how to deal with the Charities Commission, how to deal with the media, uh, how to deal with counselling problems in their communities. These things are not taught in the Darul Ulums, and so we give them a one-year intensive kind of top-up so they can go back into their communities uh, better equipped to deal with uh, the modern, messy British reality. And we also have an online course, which is a one-year diploma in Islamic psychotherapy and counselling. So we're running three things at the moment. We have uh, basically, I think, 62 full-time students right now. They never come in on Saturday, so the place seems dead. But if you come back on Monday, you'll see <laughs> students pushing and shoving and uh, uh, doing the things students usually do. It's, it's quite lively. And we have several other buildings as well, one which more or less trebles our footprint, uh, which we bought just last month. So we are slowly growing under the uh, We also do research, uh, the usual kind of academic things, conferences, uh, series of monographs, uh, academic publications and the usual bookish sort of scholarly things. You can read about those on our website. So what I've been invited to talk to you about is something that I've been ruminating on for decades, <coughs> really. I took my Shahada in December 1979, <laughs> in a different age. This was before there was anything called Islamic extremism or Islamic terrorism. It didn't occur to us that Islam and violence could be in any way connected. A completely different, rather peaceful world. The world's great terror was of nuclear conflagration rather than the things that we are exercised by now. More peaceful, but also more ignorant in some ways. People were benign towards Eastern peoples, but they never really engaged with them unless they'd been in the colonial service. Uh, and there was a certain uh, insularity still amongst the British, which remains but is attenuated compared to what it was back then. <coughs> uh, the Muslim community since then, of course, has grown exponentially. <coughs> Just since the 2011 census, Muslim community has grown by over 40%, that is, self-identifying Muslims, uh, and it's a colossal diverse cross-section of the Muslim world. So last time I looked at the figures, because you can check the Muslim figures by ethnicity, about 55% are of South Asian origin, which is what you'd expect. 
15% Arab, there's Turkish communities. 10% of self-identifying Muslims in Britain are white, which a lot of people don't know. That, of course, includes people from Eastern Europe, Russia, Bosnia, and so forth. But of those, about half are converts or descendants of converts, because if you remember how the census thing works, you tick British, British, Irish, British, they differentiate it in various ways. Once you correlate that with religious self-identification, you get some kind of indication that there's maybe, for the 2011 census, about 100,000 new Muslims or descendants of new Muslims in the UK, which means about one in 600 British people now is a convert to Islam. Gender balance, more or less 50-50. The new census, of course, which happened just a year and a half ago, they haven't crunched all the data yet, so we still can't see how many people are likely to be new Muslims. On top of that, there may be people who self-identify as Asian Muslim who are also converts. We have people working here who are of Sikh, of Sikh background or Hindu background. They're also coming towards Islam. So the figures are likely to be an underestimation. Now, if we look at the historic role of newcomers to Islam, we find that obviously the Sahaba of the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, they were all converts. They were all muhtadis. None of them was a born Muslim except for those who were very young when the Holy Prophet left this world. But in the broad course of Islam, if you look at uh, books such as Richard Bulliet's book, Islam, The View from the Edge, and other historians, they often identify the great energy in the Islamic world as being not the energy of the heartlands geographically, but the energy of the edges. Who are the dynamic peoples in Islamic history, apart from the first two centuries when it's the Arab Umayyad Caliphate? Tends to be people like the Turkic peoples, like the Malays, Central Asians. Uh, those are the ones who have spread the tradition, who have been intellectually vibrant uh, and who have uh, been militant on the frontier uh, and who have been supporting the cause of people coming into Islam. So in Muslim Spain, maybe some of us have been to see the wonders of you know, the glory that was Al-Andalus, you find that in the city of Cordoba, you had a certain kind of Arab pride. They were proud of their Arabness. <clears throat> to the north, the city of Toledo was known as the city of the Mualladun, that is to say, the city of the new Muslims. Very dynamic place, right on the frontiers. And if you think about how far Islam spread in those early centuries, what percentage of the distance between Medina and Manchester <laughs> did Islam spread in those early centuries? It's about 93% of the distance. A little bit further, uh, and there wouldn't be any new Muslims in Manchester because everybody would be an old Muslim. And <laughs> uh, but it was you know, the dominant civilizational force of the Middle Ages was the Islamic principle. Islam was about 10 times bigger geographically and demographically than what was left of Christendom. So those places, according to Bulliot, tend to be very dynamic. Whereas the places that have been Islamic for centuries and centuries tend to be a little bit somnolent and tend to have cultures that are based on repetition and are often cultures that are very divided on matters that may not be essential. So in the Ottoman Empire, for instance, many of the great viziers of the Ottoman state that kept it going for six centuries, which is not bad for a single ruling family, 1280 to 1925 is pretty good were actually from the, the Muhtedis, as they call them, the new Muslims from the Balkans. Many of the Grand Viziers, many of the great warriors, many of the great ulama, many of the great Sufi sages were actually of new Muslim origin. The great architect, Sinan, who built the great buildings of Istanbul, was of Greek origin. The greatest Ottoman admiral, Khairuddin Barbarossa, was also a convert, etc., etc. The Koprulu family, the Sokolu family of Grand Viziers who kept the the empire going, they tended to bring in the dynamism that comes from the energy and the fresh vision of the new Muslim. So our hope is that this process can continue. And in many places like the United States where the energy of new Islam tends to be very ethnically diverse and much of it is in the Hispanic communities and in the uh, African American communities. One calculation suggests that a quarter of American Muslims are actually new Muslims. That tends to be where the dynamism comes from. <coughs> if you think of African American Muslims, 
<coughs> you think of Muhammad Ali, you think of Malcolm X, etc. <coughs> How many <coughs> from, say, Arab communities in America does the world think of? Not so many. So this is what we can hope to achieve and to contribute if the religions, traditions are to be maintained. As far as British Islam is concerned, even though when you look at the map, you can see that this little windswept island is about the furthest corner of Europe from the Darul Islam. Nonetheless, we have various heroes who are, inshallah, well known to us and people we can tell our children about because their stories are thrilling. Sir Robert of St Albans, we gave a khutbah about him recently. One of the first British Muslims that we know about, in the, he died in 1187, he was one of the Knights Templars, went out from St Albans in order to do battle with the Saracens, <coughs> through a series of amazing adventures, converts to Islam and becomes Saladin's right-hand man at the Battle of Hattin, which defeats the Crusaders, marries Salah Adin's niece uh, and is buried in the Mamilla Cemetery in Al-Quds, <coughs> one of the early great heroes of British Islam. Thomas Keith, another one, <coughs> from Edinburgh, beginning of the 19th century, during the Napoleonic Wars, ends up, again, extraordinary improbable adventures, as an officer in the Ottoman army in Egypt and then in Medina. And the Ottomans like him so much, by this time he's called Ibrahim Agha, they're so impressed by him, his piety, uh, that they appoint him to be the governor of the holy city of Medina. The current governor was visiting Cambridge recently and he actually knew about this, <coughs> this guy and his uh, very positive memory, the Scotsman who became governor of Medina. And there are so many others, William Williamson, Abdullah Quilliam. It's a small history, but it's actually a history of extraordinary people. So it's something that we need to familiarise ourselves with, <coughs> rather than assuming that we are part of some diaspora, which is in many ways the Whitehall vision of the Muslim community. Islam is, well, it's baggage of ethnicity, it's to do with migration, and often it is. We don't really fit their narrative. We don't really fit anybody's narrative. There is something <coughs> venturesome about straddling the great alleged boundary in today's world between East and West, Christendom, Islam, tradition, modernity. It's a very exciting thing to occupy both worlds, because if you've been in Islam for a while, and you're from a non-Muslim background, sooner or later you realise that you're still the same person. A lot of your problems have been solved. <coughs> you're dealing with complex new social uh, contexts. You're still the same person. You're still from where you were. And in a very curious sense, people often report that they feel that they're more embedded in where they were than they were previously. That's a subtle thing, but it's very frequently reported by people who come to Islam here and around the world. That it's not a move into an alien cultural sphere, such as those many British people who become Tibetan Buddhists, for instance. That's a huge leap. <coughs> There's no real overlap between traditional British monotheistic Bible reading culture and the world of Tibet. That's leaving everything behind. When you come into Islam, you're taking the only major spiritual step that allows you still to maintain the stories that were important to you and to your ancestors. In a sense, it's not really a conversion, it's a kind of growth into something that just makes more sense. This is important, again, because a lot of people think, oh, you're a new Muslim, you're like a newborn baby, you leave everything behind, you tear off the clothes of your ancestors and you join some kind of Oriental or African or Arab alternative reality, but people who attempt that generally find it's taking on too much. You can take on the practices of Islam, that's already a lot, getting up for Fajr, Ramadan, etc. That's a lot to carry. If at the same time you're expected to conform to the norms of somebody else's culture, that's too much to carry. And nobody should be expected to make those two big jumps together. It's too much. And those who try it, because their mothers-in-law say, I won't talk to you unless you're dressed the way you know, my family dress back in Bangladesh or wherever. Uh, 
is going to be extremely difficult. So the point about joining Islam as the successful convert have regularly reported is that it's not a shift in culture, it's a correction of culture. You realise that the pub culture, getting drunk actually isn't such fun really when you remember what it was like. It's something you do for the boys or because it's a rite of passage. It's not really a very pleasant experience to be drunk. I remember it myself and thinking at the time, this is actually quite unpleasant. I'm feeling sick, this, my body is saying no, but yeah, I drank four pints tonight and this is something, it's ego. Leaving that behind is a liberation. Another aspect of this, of course, is that you have a clearer sense of place. One of the things the Qur'an does that its readers who come to it for the first time, including my students, are most taken aback by is its constant aversions to God's signs in nature. You don't really get that in the New Testament. In the Old Testament it's there, but it tends to be about the natural world in Palestine, the Promised Land, milk and honey. The Bible doesn't really talk much about wildlife in Egypt, for instance. It's about the land. For the New Testament, it's irrelevant, except for the Gadarene swine, perhaps. That's not really a very attractive story anyway. But then the Qur'an comes along, and you have this endless evocation of God's signs in nature. Have you not seen this? Have you not seen that? <coughs> the birds that fly with their two wings, the creatures that crawl upon the earth, the fish, it's very nature-oriented. Whatever explanation you might have for that sudden shift in the progressive story of monotheisms, it's something that allows you to know that you belong wherever you are. So another experience of the kind of veteran convert is that they tend to feel more embedded in their place than they did before. Because they can look at what's left of the natural world <coughs> and they know what it means. <coughs> it's not <coughs> scarce resources. It's not mountains to climb and feel proud about your achievements, it's not marathons to run, it's not conquering nature, it's about seeing the presence of the divine in the natural world, about God's ayat everywhere. So one experience, again, a successful veteran convert is always that you see your country more deeply. Many born Muslims may not notice, it doesn't matter, they have their own issues to deal with. They may not be hiking or meditating by the sea, they've got, that's not important. What is important is what happens in the Qur'an where it constantly says uh, in, truly in the succession of night and day uh, and the moon, the sun, uh, there are signs for people of reflection. This is the basic Qur'anic argument for how you connect with the divine. And that's universal, that's not from the east, that's not from the west. Some people think it sounds a bit shamanistic. That's fashionable nowadays, by the way. To be a shaman, that's okay. To be a monotheist is <laughs> problematic. But there is something of that, of that awareness of the intrinsic sacrality of virgin nature that is important for us. If you look at the website of the Cambridge Mosque, you can download Reza Shah Kazumi's article on Islam and virgin nature. And it's always the case with the true spiritual teacher in Islam that he or she loves to be in nature, talks about nature, and as it were, finds the presence of virgin nature refreshing. A lot of modern Muslim preachers never leave the city, and that's one reason for their agitation and their disconnection. The Quran is very clear. Travel in the earth, see the signs. So this means... <coughs> As some of our leaders in the British Muslim community have realised, like Sheikh Abdullah Ross, Allah been dead for about 20 years now, but he had a zawiya in Dalston, I think it was, in London, Naqshbandi Sheikh, Scottish origin, <coughs> uh, and his book, which I think is called The School of the Celestial Fire, by Peter Collinet, is worth looking into. I remember him dimly. He was insistent that this aspect of Quranic religion uh, if it's followed, is a sign of not only 
the authentic connection to the presence of God, but the authentic pr- connection to what is local. <coughs> he used to take his disciples on wild trips around the country to places that he considered to be of intrinsic sacrality, places of spiritual power. <coughs> and that made sense to his community, it's a Naqshbandi community, because it's Qur'anic and because, of course, wherever you travel, as the Qur'an says, wherever you turn, there is Allah's face. <coughs> the Islamophobes, various kinds, say, we're always foreigners here, we don't belong. But the Qur'an is saying, wherever you detect the presence of God in the beauty of nature, you belong to that place. And you probably belong more than the guy in Lycra who's cycling around with his looking down in his goggles and defeating the landscape, not engaging with it. This is important. So part of the tradition of indigenous Islam in the UK has often been the strong engagement with nature and getting out of the cities. It's a sign of spiritual health that you want to breathe God's clean air and look at trees and sit by <coughs> Lake Windermere. This is you know, part of uh, spiritual health <coughs> in the Qur'an's vision. Other aspects that give Islam the sense that you're, the title of my new book, Travelling Home, that the journey to God is always a journey home, not just because he is before the beginning of time our source, and at the end of the time, end of time will be inshallah, our place of return. But that the divine name Al-Qarib, the near, means that the more you progress inwardly, the more beautiful you'll be outwardly. And the better will be your view of your fellow human beings. And this again is a good sign <coughs> to differentiate between people who are really following the classic beauty of Islam and those whose Islamic identity is about anxiety and difference. And there are a lot of people in our mosques and in our community who are really obsessed with identity and difference and threat and they're very fearful, even though the Qur'an says the people who believe in Allah, no fear is upon them, neither shall they grieve. So a lot of fear, (coughs) paranoia, victim culture, Panics over identity is all a sign of weak faith, even if the language that justifies it claims to be loudly Islamic. I was reading just yesterday a classical Persian text about a Central Asian saint, Khwaja Ubaidullah Ahrar, who's buried near Samarkand in now in Uzbekistan. And <coughs> The biography said, when the Khawaja, this is like an honourable, nobleman, religious teacher and elder, was a little boy, he assumed that everybody he ever saw was remembering Allah. Whoever he saw in the street, the villagers, the guy selling stuff in shops, he just assumed, of course, Allah is all in all. Naturally, everybody is remembering Allah. And it was only later in life that he realised that some people who... Kind of <laughs> are not doing that. So the story continued, as I recall. When he was a teenager, this rough guy from the steppes to the north, what's now Kazakhstan, where people were not educated at all, Turkmen nomads, came to the house to sell them sacks of flour. So the Khwaja, who's I guess 13 at the time, did the transaction and put the flour away. And when he went out, he saw the guy had gone with his little cart. And he felt very bad because he said, I want this guy to pray for me, because assuming everybody was remembering Allah all the time, (coughs) he would always ask people to pray for him. And he was very restless about this, so he went out to look for this rough guy. And he looked everywhere. Kazakhstan to the north, that's like a million square miles of just grass. (laughs) There's nothing there. He found him finally, (coughs) went to him and apologised and said, I let you go and I didn't ask for your prayer and your blessing. And this rough guy said, you know, why are you from a noble family asking me this? I don't even know how to wash my face properly. (laughs) Why are you asking me for anything? You're becoming a scholar of religion. 
but he uh, asked for it and the wild guy put out his hands and said something and that was the first great step that Khawaja Ubaidullah Ahrar took spiritually and the lesson from that is as he said my teacher, somebody called Baba Samasi said whoever you meet assume that it's Al-Khidr Al-Khidr, familiar with this mysterious, miraculous, enigmatic, wandering, immortal who dispenses spiritual guide whoever you see, assume that's the best of people and in every day, assume that's the best day. And assume every place is the best place. And every time is Laylatul Qadr. Live like that. Presence in every breath, intensity. And this is what's called Husna Zan, giving people the benefit of the doubt, which is a virtue that the world really lacks. Entertainment, news, gossip columns, chit-chat in mosques, it's all about who's doing this, who's doing that, suspiciousness. This is not the way of true Islam. True Islam is assuming everybody is khidr. <laughs> Maybe not so easy. Another story I came across. It's an amazing book. Rasha Hayat Ayn al Hayat of uh, Ali Safi, 16th century from what is now the sad land of Afghanistan, but was then a land of prosperity, diversity, and wisdom. Shabaha ad Din Naqshband. This is a couple of centuries before Ubaidullah Ahrar. <coughs> in his spiritual journeying, he had an element of pride within him. So his sheikh said, you must spend the next seven years just serving people. Go around Bukhara and see anybody who needs an errand, an old woman who needs shopping done, do that. And he does it. He goes back to his teacher, Amir Kulal. And his teacher says, the next seven years you have to serve the street dogs of Bukhara. Big test for his ego. In that culture, dogs, rabies. But he spends the next seven years in obedience to his sheikh. If he found a dog that was sick or had a wound, he would bind it up. He would engage with the animals. He would go out and find food for them. Seven years. This helped him to overcome the ego. And then towards the end of that period, he'd been bandaging the leg of some wounded dog that he found in the street. And the dog rolled over onto its back and started kind of <coughs> whining because of the spiritual state of the young Baha Adi Nabshband and because of his Hosna Zan, good opinion of everybody and everything, he puts out his hands and he says, Amin, Amin, <laughs> assuming that the dog is not just a whining dog but that it's making a du'a. And he says, at that moment I saw Allah's mercy and his presence in everything and everyone and that moment has never left me. Well, these are distant times. <laughs> Nowadays, it's hard to maintain this practice of trying to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But if you go into a mosque somewhere in the UK and everybody is from a particular ethnic group and they kind of look at you, or if you're a woman and they don't allow you in any way, or whatever it else, else it is, it's very important to assume each one of them is khidr. Each one of them is a wali. And the issues they're dealing with come from something to do with their dislocation that you can't imagine, that you don't have to deal with, give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't feel, I'm the true Muslim. Why are they like this? Why is this a Brailvi mosque and that a Deobandi mosque and that an Ahl al-Hadith mosque and there's several in the street and they won't give each other a face? No, that's dangerous. It doesn't benefit you at all. All of this convertitis, we sometimes call it. <laughs> Here I am. I'm praying Fajr and I do this and these people, I don't know, they don't seem to understand Islam. Even though those people have, may have been Islam for a thousand, in Islam for a thousand years, give it a break, you don't need to go there. It's hard to be not terribly educated and to be a born Muslim in England. It's not a very easy thing because everything seems so wild and strange. Even the England they may have migrated to in the 50s and 60s has changed beyond any recognition. They never expected that the churches would be empty, that people would be flipping from one gender to another the way they do, that all kinds of things that are historically regarded as aberrations are now unassailable, and it's very hard for them to accommodate that, as well as dealing with the census return, the council tax, the, the, the simple grind of getting life done in modern Britain. So don't be too judgmental of people who are struggling and as a result of that struggle, want their mosques just to be a place where they can kind of curl up and be themselves for a bit. 
It's not what a mosque should be. The Islamic name for a mosque is Jamia, which means inclusive. A mosque should include everybody and anybody of every ethnicity and people who aren't Muslim just looking around. And that's how it should be. That's how the Holy Prophet's mosque was. But don't get too angry if people can't manage that. It doesn't mean you should go to that mosque and maybe be looked at with incredulity every week. Because in Islam, another liberation, we don't have a parish structure. <coughs> there is no local priest who is automatically the guy you have to go to, who is answerable to a bishop, who has a creed, who sets out what happens in every church and the cultures. Islam is much more pluralistic, organic, decentered. If one mosque doesn't press your buttons, find another. If none of them seem that you're at ease with them, even if outwardly they seem to be practicing properly, but if you really don't feel that you're benefiting spiritually in any of them, then you can find some smaller congregation that's meeting somewhere, and there's more and more of these student Islamic societies, convert groups, little brotherhoods of various kinds, sometimes hard to find, but it's usually possible to find your own spiritual home, and it's entirely legitimate for you to be in that space, because there's no archbishop to tell you, no, you have to be in the parish church. Islam doesn't work like that. Sometimes new Muslims find it difficult to get used to the fact that they're no longer in an organised religion. Islam is not organised religion, you could say disorganised religion if you like. That's probably healthier. Every mosque does its own thing. Every Muslim orientation and madhab and mashrab and tariqah, they do their own things. That can be a bit daunting at first, especially when people say, brother, brother, in the true madhab, you're... Trousers should be a little bit shorter. And if you've just taken your shahadi, you think, I thought he was going to tell me about God. <laughs> uh, no, trousers, brother. Uh, you can easily kind of get angry about that or get self-righteous about that. There's lots of diversity, but ultimately you see that that's a blessing because you will be able, inshallah, to find the space where you belong. Even if it's a small circle of like-minded people, that's fine. The praying congregation... You can do everything that is obligatory for you in the religion with just a small number of people. That's a great blessing. Another thing, another perk that you discover is the fact that despite all of these completely unnecessary <coughs> issues that happen in the mosques, what's essential is always present. It's very hard to find a mosque that really, by classical Islamic studies, you could say is heretical. You shouldn't go there for doctrinal reasons. The Catholic Church generally won't allow the Anglican to take communion. The Greek Orthodox don't want to see the Methodists. So they have very significant, polite but firm differences. But just about any mosque you're ever going to go to anywhere in the Islamic world, even a Sunni, Shi'i mosque, Basically, the essence of the religion is there, and the scholars will say, it's fine for you to pray there. Probably, there are places where you feel more at home than others, but you've got 10 million mosques in the Islamic world. And one of the great privileges of joining Islam is that you can go into any of those mosques and join the congregation, and at least if you know how to pray, you'll be doing exactly the same thing as everybody else. Go into a village in Indonesia... Uh, or into a mosque in northern Nigeria or wherever, the practice is the same. The Qur'an is the same. That's a miracle. There's no other religion that has achieved that in this disruptive and divisive age. Ten million mosques, more or less all of them, doing the same thing, facing the same qibla, the same copy of the Qur'an, the same Arabic, the same rules for the prayer, with insignificant but interesting variations between the madhabs. That's remarkable. <coughs> And it's something for which we should be giving thanks. Friends of mine who are in the Catholic Church are completely annoyed with Pope Francis for suppressing the Latin Mass. They love the Latin Mass. It's the Mathers of the Saints. It goes back a thousand years. He doesn't like it. He wants everybody to follow the new form of worship. They change it, update it every few years. Anglican Church does the same thing. In Islam, <coughs> nobody has the authority uh, to interfere with your form of worship. One of the great gifts of Islam is it gives you unchanged, immutable, but uh, practicable, doable forms of devotion to Almighty God 
that nobody has ever had the effrontery to interfere with. There's never been some group of muftis that says, oh, we're going to change the qibla this year, or we're going to have people, the imam, wearing shorts or something, because it's more up-to-date. Nobody has the right to do that. Uh, and as the years go by, you'll realise the, the strength and the constancy and the solidity that get, that gives you, because all the basic practices of Islam are very universal. They're not really culturally specific. And they're practised east and west and everywhere. They're primordial in their simplicity. So this too is something to bear in mind, that ultimately what we are looking for in a religion <coughs> is a way of facing God, acknowledging that we don't deserve it, that we're full of forgetfulness and bad memories and all of the stuff that we all have, but that we are facing a God who is compassionate and merciful and forgiving, <coughs> and that we are able to do that in a form that is uncontroversial uh, and that you can expect to find everywhere. That's an extraordinary blessing. It doesn't give you any kind of human layer of interference between you and the Creator. Because of the authority of the Sunnah, when we were designing the new Cambridge Mosque, <coughs> you can guess the two big controversies. It wasn't what size the mosque should be or... <coughs> <coughs> How many will dot taps? No, two things. First of all, what kind of food will be served in the cafeteria? <laughs> okay. okay, I'm interested in that as well, so I didn't mind. But then the women thing, uh, again and again, has to be in a separate room, brother. You can't let the women attend, brother, because they bring fitna. You can't let them bring children because they make a noise. That was constant. And so, as you saw, I think many of you have been to the mosque, we offer different spaces, women with small children, <coughs> the mezzanine, and the screen, which is of different height, so they can see, where, see if they want to not be seen, if they don't want to be seen. But ultimately what clinched the argument is the sunnah. Uh, it's not ultimately about people's culture, it's about the authority of the Holy Prophet and his mosque. Now in his mosque, they didn't have a screen at all between the men and the women, as far as any historian can determine. <coughs> we weren't that fundamentalist, if you like, in our approach. People would be uncomfortable. But we did want to make sure that you know, we were not violating the basic teachings by putting the women in an airless box that's hoovered once a month, <laughs> um, the things that they usually have to put up with. It can be bad. I was once, <coughs> when I was very young, hitchhiking around America, spending each night in a mosque, one night in the mosque in Albany, I think it was, in northern uh, New York State, they said, oh, brother, after Isha, the ladies don't come for Fajr, you can sleep in the ladies' section. Fine. So I lay down on the carpet. Middle of the night, I woke up, and there was kind of noise. Turned on the light, and there was about 500 cockroaches running around. <laughs> Enormous big ones. <laughs> so I, I don't like insects. So I spent the rest of the night in the in the garden outside. It was a kind of old sofa, so I slept on that. So it has to be faced that many of these communities don't really remember how the Holy Prophet wanted to integrate women into worship, even though very often synagogue worship and church worship sometimes doesn't do it or does it differently, but we, the inclusion of sisters in the jamia is important. But very often converts, women go to mosques in England and they find that there isn't a space for them don't feel superior, don't feel angry, find some other context. That's just the nature of being Muslim successfully. Smile, say, Asalaamu Alaikum, I didn't know that brother, thank you so much, may Allah reward you for saving up, for building this beautiful mosque. That's better for your heart, and then go off to find some context where things are different. Because if you push against them, you'll never make any headway you'll probably find that the mosque committee is made up entirely of men of a certain age whose roots are in a certain village in a certain part of the world. They're not going to listen to you if you're a new Muslim from wherever. It's not going to happen. But don't get angry about that. Just say, this is how they are, move on, and you will find a spiritual strength in not being judgmental. This is really important. But the indigenizing of the religion, well, you can probably see from the various bits and pieces that we have here. I mean, 
as I said at the beginning, Islam is already indigenous. Lillahi <coughs> al wal maghrib. The east and the west belong to God. Wherever you turn, there is God's face. The natural world, so wherever we go, we're already at home. We can't be exiled in this dunya, except insofar as we forget the source of things. So non-Muslim atheists are much more foreign and alien than we are, because we can relate to <coughs> our surroundings, and we can also relate to the past history of this country where people believed in God. Maybe not the same way we believe in God, maybe not so different after all. And we can relate to the history, the ancient churches, the sensibilities of traditional England, Scotland, wherever, much better than the average British agnostic or atheist or New Age Buddhist can. That's important to understand. We belong more than others do. So, yeah, a few things here. Uh, I did this almost 20 years ago now, which Muslim Songs of the British Isles, which is essentially a collection of <coughs> poems from Abdullah Kuliam's community, people like Yahya Parkinson, Amherst Thiessen, Obedullah Cunliffe and others, stalwarts of late Victorian, early Edwardian Islam, set them to various tunes which come from English folk traditions and from Scottish folk traditions. <coughs> These things are not, believe it or not, flying off the shelves in Waterstones. It's more or less a kind of private uh, hobby. This also, which has a CD, is using entirely Celtic melodies, a uh, traditional narration of uh, the history of the Holy Prophet's family. Uh, and there's a CD that goes with it. And there is other things that we do by way of experiment. So, yeah, the indigenizing of Islam, you know, we've always been here. E.J. Carr's book, A Day in the Country, which was made into a BBC film, few years ago. It's quite a lyrical, gentle book about a guy who is doing archaeological work in a village churchyard. <coughs> and maybe some of you saw the film. The book is a bit better and a bit more serious about its purpose. Uh, the archaeologist is cleaning the medieval frescoes in this ancient church, which was built by crusaders. And he gets very close to the images as he peels off the patina of ages and gets rid of the whitewash and sees these images, of the Last Judgment and so forth. And he works out <coughs> what the guy kind of, he finds little bits of the guy's hair in the old paint, the kind of blonde guy, and constructs an image of who this person was. But there's no sign of who this person was in the cemetery which is being excavated until at last they find one grave outside the <coughs> walls of the consecrated ground and they find this skeleton in the grave and around the skeleton's neck there's a little crescent. There have been Muslims here for a long time, quietly. Some Muslims who come to this country from overseas think this is the land of the Kafir, it's the land of the British Raj, etc. But no, there's another story here which needs to be treated as a story of heroes, a story of people who dealt with Archbishop Lord's Inquisition, the three Welshmen who were impaled on stakes in the 16th century for converting to Islam. It's a <coughs> hidden history, but an important history, and one that, as our numbers increase and as we become a statistically significant part of the British Ummah, is going to become more normativized. Because the newer generation of people who are from overseas, <coughs> with each generation, you go to British schools, they become more British. And that's what always happens to communities when they move from one country to another. So the apparent divide between the cradle Muslim and the new Muslim is a lot less than it was when I first joined Islam. When <coughs> a lot of even young Muslims back then couldn't really speak English and where they couldn't disentangle Islam from their culture that they'd brought with them. They couldn't imagine an Islam that wasn't their Islam. And if they met Muslims from different ethnicities, they found it very difficult to relate to them. 
Much of that with the new generation is now a thing of the past. People are intermarrying more, they're engaging more. Even some of the mosques are becoming a little bit more diverse. The Somalis are there, the Bosnians are there, the Kurds are there, as communities move around and become less concentrated. So I think in that sense, it's easier now to be a new Muslim than it was at the outset, despite the psychobabble of war on terror and uh, the Islamophobia industry and all of that. Things are a little bit easier because the community is a little bit, <coughs> well, considerably more open to the possibility of difference. There are some mosques that don't want to do it. That's fine. Assalamu alaikum. Please pray for us, brothers. But there's more and more mosques, more and more Muslim environments, particularly those where the new generation is starting to exercise authority that we can and should engage with. Some converts head for the hills, literally following the prophetic uh, advice in times of turbulence. Take a flock of sheep, go off to the hills, flee from the fitna. Well... There probably aren't enough sheep to go around for us all to <laughs> be able to do that. Picturesque um, for a while. But most of us have real lives and real jobs and real families and we're probably mostly living in an urban environment <coughs> and dealing with existing Muslim structures. And I feel that more and more, particularly if we push a little bit, if you manage to get a group of ladies to push for there to be a women's space in the mosque, then eventually... In many cases, the doors will open. Push for a convert circle. Push for something for young people. <coughs> and eventually, um, as the hearts start to soften, you'll find that this becomes much more possible. But again, just to finish off, because I think people were proposing to ask questions. Uh, ultimately, unless you're in the religion for God and his messenger, and you're in love with God and his messenger, the other stuff may become overwhelming. <coughs> Turn to God constantly, face the Qibla, open your heart, confess that you're not right, ask for the Almighty to rectify you, to heal you, to pour out the water of his healing acceptance, to guide you to good things, to guide you to a fuller understanding of his presence in nature. <coughs> to guide you to the state whereby you can see al-khidr in everybody, to guide you to the state where you appreciate <coughs> the unique and irreplaceable sanctity of every moment, so every moment becomes like Laylatul Qadr. And if you're in that state, then whatever your outward circumstances might be, then you're almost an ecstatic human being. And that's what we are looking for, because Allah calls us to the abode of peace, calls us to sa'ada, calls us to happiness. And to know who you are, to know that you are created by and returning to a generous God, <coughs> to know that everything ultimately is in good hands, in God's hands, even if much of it necessarily we don't understand, is the most healing and balancing and grounding basis for human life that anybody can find. It's a great blessing. <coughs> Islam is a hospital. It's not a place where you get burdened with stuff and rulings and issues. It's a place where everything is a form of liberation. Liberation from the lower self, from the worst things within yourself, from a wrong attitude to other people. It's about freeing yourself and having the confidence to, to love, to accept, and to see as often as you can that the world is nothing other than the majestic and colourful interplay of God's 99 names. That's all it is. If you're in that state, you can't help but be happy. Khutbah <laughs> over. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to chair this, or <coughs> perhaps there aren't any questions. I have a question. Yeah, sister. So, you know, you said about this, um, these the three Welshmen. Mm -hmm. What's the story? I've never heard of that one. Yeah, it, it's, a lot of these things are buried in kind of ancient court records, but <coughs> Archbishop Lord, who was the big kind of uh, Archbishop of Canterbury who learnt Arabic and was concerned that British seamen overseas, because we're a maritime nation that a lot of British people were going off to the Muslim world, coming back, and some of them came back as Muslims, he instituted <coughs> something called the Laudian Inquisition, 
which was a kind of miniature Anglican version of the Spanish Inquisition, whereby people would be investigated and checked and noticed if they were not eating pork or not drinking or something like that. And then there were uh, methods for re-admitting them to the church, as in the Spanish Inquisition, you had to wear a long pointed hat, the hat of the penitents, you had to stand at the back of the church and couldn't participate until you were formally readmitted to communion. <coughs> and some people who rejected that were put to death. Mm-hmm. But nobody's really researched it because you know, countries archives are so enormous and it would take a lifetime really to look for these individual stories. It's easier with the Spanish Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition, a lot more people have done that. I was in Malta a couple of months ago where they've turned the Palace of the Inquisition into a museum. And a lot of scholars have done very good work on their records because they used to record absolutely everything that happened during the interrogations. <coughs> they did get quite a lot of English seamen who they'd convicted of converting to Islam, but they were every possible nationality. There were uh, a lot of Greek converts, French converts. Um, they kept escaping from the prison, the Palace of the Inquisition, and this Frenchman kept escaping, and they would find him and bring him back again. Very, I mean, it's a horrible place because they've reconstructed the torture chamber, and you see how vehement it was. But <coughs> yeah, there were British people involved. But in England, despite the Anglican thing, the break with Rome, there was this miniature inquisition directed largely against uh, uh, converts to Islam under Archbishop Lord Hisham Matar in his book on England in the 16th century writes a little bit about it. Thank you. Yep, towards the back. It may be that one's path to salvation lies through all kinds of tunnels and obstacles, and the life of faith is often like that. Imam Ghazali, our greatest theologian, went through a terrible period of crisis and doubt, and wandering in the desert for ten years looking for certainty. There's no guarantee that the road is going to be smooth. (coughs) Each individual is going to be different, so there isn't one kind of magic pill for all of these states. (coughs) They say... The roads to God are as numerous as the breaths drawn by his creatures. There's many paths up the mountain, and some of them are rocky, some of them are not. But if you... The ideal thing is to find a spiritual teacher or a spiritual guide to whom you can go to share these things, (coughs) and who will, if it's a true guide, be able to find you the appropriate, as it were, prescription medicines to sort out Uh, the particular difficulty that you're going with. If you can't find that, then there are certain classical texts which the ulama have recommended that you can connect with. Uh, The Revival of the Religious Sciences by Imam al-Ghazali is something that is frequently commended for those who haven't had the good fortune to find a qualified spiritual guide. So we have this um, Travelling Light series, which is on the Mishkat Media website, whereby you have 40, almost 40 so far, lectures based on the 40 lessons, spiritual lessons of Imam al-Ghazali and his revival of the religious sciences. Uh, And a lot of people who look at them do find this to be personally very direct and and helpful. So you could check out one or two of those. (coughs) But, yeah, again, just to repeat myself, the road of faith is frequently a difficult one. But in the difficulties, often we, we find a way to grow. Anyone else? Yeah. Where do you see the future of kind of indigenous British Islam? What would you imagine? Uh, The world is in such a kind of weird and unprecedented state at the moment that it's hard to know where anything in this country will be in 10 years' time. Uh, There's just so many 
fundamentally strange and unfamiliar things happening to attitudes to the family, even fundamental things about gender, relation, everything is being renegotiated and made strange <coughs> to anybody who has a traditional sensibility. And the Muslim community, some people will go along with that. Others will heroically, but perhaps excessively and angrily resist. But I think basically our role is just to kind of keep the ship afloat so that the people who are lost in this sea of hyper-individualism and too many choices find Islam as a kind of stable place to be um, in what is an increasingly turbulent and strange social reality where everything nowadays has become a question and a challenge. Uh, so I'm reasonably confident that with a good or a better leadership and enough resources and a few places where new Muslims can go where they're not kind of told to be something else, uh, that the numbers will continue to grow. We registered 103 shahadas at the Cambridge Mosque last year. <coughs> the numbers keep going up. We had 19 just in January. Despite the media thing and the mess of the Muslim community, people are still coming. It's often very moving to see the huge, you know, we had an Anglican Church of Scotland priest who converted upstairs, a Jesuit priest who converted. It's kind of <coughs> very humbling to see people wanting to take this step. And inshallah people will continue to do so, but the future is in God's hands. All we can do is hope and pray that for, a good, for a good outcome. But yeah, humanity is in a very strange state at the moment. Yeah. Climate crisis, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, War in Europe, <coughs> um, it's very unsettling. But sometimes it's in times of uh, people's doubts about worldly solutions that people are looking for something a little bit better and, and, and deeper. So maybe all of these scientifically induced crises will precipitate human beings back to an interest in the thing that humanity has always been most interested in, which is, which is faith and you know, the access to the sacred. Anyone else? Yeah. Don't look at screens too often. Social media is mostly a, a waste of time and causes a kind of turbulence in the brain. Don't look at images or films that are kind of particularly extreme and disturbing. It's not good for the soul, especially in the evening. <coughs> uh, try and be with people with whom you feel kind of natural and at peace, even if some of them are not Muslims. Imam Ghazali cites this great scholar forget his name, who says, it's better to be in the company of a non-Muslim with good manners than to, to be in the company of a Muslim with bad, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, with bad manners. And that's important because those people, even though their doctrines might be right, will still settle your heart. <coughs> um, yeah, just uh, maintain love for Allah and his messenger. Read the seerah, the prophetic biography, a lot. Uh, a lot of people, it's, it's the basic practice for the Cambridge Crescent, the new Muslims group here, they just read Martin Ling's Sira over and over again, and they find it amazing. They engage with Sira a lot. And just recognise that the modern world, even though it's barking at religion, and insisting that we change, uh, is in such a mess that it doesn't have the right to do that. The Qur'an says, Idfa' billati hiya ahsan. When you suffer an aggression, push back with something better. So just pray for them, hope for the best, try and help them. But don't respond in a kind of angry or panicky way because that doesn't help them, doesn't help you. Try and be serene. Everything is in Allah's hands. Everything is simply a concatenation of his qualities and his decrees. And we need, even though this is a time when some of his qualities of rigor, difficult qualities are manifest, we need to remember everything's from him.
Um, yep. Something I sometimes get worried about when I read through the Quran is the verse about Hijrah. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes I just don't know where the line is. I, I kind of, I, how would you contextualize that within this? Well, in the Quranic context, of course, it's talking about Muslims having to flee persecution mm-hmm. in Mecca to Medina. The ulama subsequently have discussed the permissibility of remaining as what's now called a minority outside the abode of Islam. (coughs) Generally, they didn't like it. And they said, you certainly shouldn't have children outside the world of Islam because you don't know how your children are going to be brought up or what influences they'll be under. However, nowadays, where exactly is the abode of Islam? So many Muslims are trying to come to the West, including religious Muslims. Sometimes there are more freedoms here. Sometimes you can find a little group here that is a good context for your Islam, that is free to practice in a way that you can't do in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, a lot of those places which are subject to considerable scrutiny. So the old rules about not migrating outside the abode of Islam, I think, aren't really applicable in our circumstances. Now, if there was a, a good ideal Muslim country somewhere (coughs) where they dealt with poverty and they did the Islamic things. Well, I'd probably go there myself. I haven't found it yet. A lot of Muslims from this country are going to Dubai at the moment, but that's not quite what the Sharia has in mind, I think. Thank you. Yep. Well, not really, but there are certain places which are better than others. I happen to like Uzbekistan, I like Senegal, I like Indonesia. Those are places where I feel people are kind of naturally Muslim and not stressed or artificial or extreme, uh, but are profound believers. So there are places where I wouldn't mind living, certainly. Senegal is amazing. But then 